This video is all about trimming, the basic stuff, how to hold tools, how to fasten pots to the wheel, how to recognise all manner of issues and how to fix them. I started by just throwing a few basic cylindrical forms on which to demonstrate. I then let them sit out overnight to firm up to a state called leather hard, but more on that later. The first thing we need to discuss are trimming tools. These are typically the kinds I use. Their blades are made from tungsten carbide, which means they are incredibly sharp and they last a long time, but they are very brittle. And if you drop one, the blade will smash or chip. Typically, these types of turning tools tend to be quite expensive, and I generally don't recommend them for beginners. And the analogy I like using is that you would never let someone learning how to drive a car learn in a sports car. So whilst these turning tools are fantastic, I wouldn't recommend purchasing some until you're more well-versed with some of the other variants. These sharp loop tools have similar shaped blades, but they're almost 10 times cheaper. The metal on these wears out quite quickly as they're pushed against abrasive clay, but they'll teach you the skills you need to know before moving on to the more expensive type. Here's what I mean by the blade diminishing, and there'll even come a point when this metal snaps. You can sharpen these tools yourself though. I use a file and a bench grinder to hone their edges a bit, but really they're so cheap and cheerful that it's sometimes easier just to replace them after a year or two of use. Most pottery supplies will sell a range of these types of tools, but you do need to be careful that you're purchasing the right shape of blade, as these ones, which look almost identical in terms of profile, have blades that are completely rounded and are utterly useless for trimming pots. They're meant for sculpting rather than trimming, so avoid these if you can. Lastly, you'll find turning tools with big flat blades like so. These aren't very good at removing clay, rather they're better at shaping it and they're tools I'll use after I've removed a majority of the mass from a piece of pottery, and I just want to refine the shape. They're not particularly good at removing a lot of clay at once, so I tend to use them for a few specific tasks rather than a majority of my trimming. Ultimately, the most important thing is your hands themselves, how you hold the tool, how you move it, and lastly, the condition of your clay. When you hold the turning tool, you don't want to hold it near the back, like this, as you'll have very little control over the tool and you won't be able to dig it in very firmly whilst maintaining control. Held like this, it really just skids over the surface and for it to remove any reasonable amount, you need to use an absurd amount of pressure. So instead of holding it at the far end, hold it close to the blade. Lean your forearm on the wheel tray and then lean your upper body weight onto that arm. We want this trimming hand to be as stable as possible when trimming. After all, you want to control the clay you don't want the clay controlling you. As I work, my left hand will do one of two things. It'll either loosely clasp around the pot, ready to catch it if it comes loose, and you can also feel with those digits if the pot has come off center. Whilst doing that, I also rest the thumb of my left hand on the thumb of my right hand, so each supports the other and adds stability to my movements. Now, the first thing you want to check is the condition of your clay. It should feel like slightly cold, damp, leather, and if you squeeze it, it shouldn't easily deform, so you should be able to pick it up, move it around, and even tap it quite firmly without any of it distorting. And one way to test this is to very gently squeeze the rim. If it holds its shape, then it's dry enough to be trimmed. But if, as you squeeze, it moves easily like this, then it's still far too soft to trim. Your fingers shouldn't leave imprints on the clay, nor should it stick to your hands. And so, the next part of this process is to attach this pot firmly to the wheel. And whilst I do quickly tap center the pot here, that's not what this video is about. And I have one specifically about that process, which I'll link to down in the description below or on screen now. One way of securing the pot in place is by pushing three lumps of soft clay around the pot, equally spaced like the points of a triangle. As I do this, I keep the pot pinned down so it doesn't shift off center as I push the soft pieces of clay against the pot. This is but one of a few ways of attaching it down, and you can do it with the pot either facing up like this or flipped upside down with the base pointing up. But for a majority of my pieces, I do it a different way. I brush some slip over the base, making sure I don't coat it all the way to the center, as if the entirety of the base sticks to the wheel and it can be quite difficult to remove. You can see just how quickly this slip dries, just in the time it's taken to speak these few words. So I'll apply some more, you don't want loads, and then I place it onto the wheel and tap center it. The friction caused by the clay rubbing against the metal helps it stick, and then the slip itself dries too, holding it firmly. 
So lastly, just to make sure it's really securely held in place, I use the corner of a plastic kidney and compress just the bottom portion of the wall into the metal wheel. And that should be enough to really firmly secure the pot in place. And one bonus of this method is that there aren't any lugs of clay that get in the way of your trimming and you can work all the way from top to bottom. Although typically, this is a technique I save for larger, more complex pieces. And so, usually for mugs and other simple pots, I use a chuck. This is a solid piece of clay, which I throw with a tapering shape so that it can fit a variety of different shapes of pots. Leather hard pieces are slotted over it and trimmed like normal, but first, the chuck needs to be attached to the wheel. And I do this in practically the same way I attach leather hard pots to the wheel. Like shown earlier in this video, slip is coated onto the bottom and then it's tap centered into place. Once firmly stuck down, the leather hard pot is placed onto it, but it still needs to be centered so that the top of the piece is totally level and spinning true. And so to do this, I tap center the piece again. But this time I focus my tapping at the top of the pot. I rhythmically strike it with my right hand whilst my left hand is pushing down to pin the pot lightly down in place. Then I firmly push the whole pot down over the chuck. And finally, I use a spinner tool which is placed on top and through this I can apply downward pressure. These are useful tools to use on the bases of pots as it distributes the pressure that your fingertips might usually apply in one small spot and they're especially useful when the bases of the pots you've made are very thin. I then take my trimming tool, as normal, clasp firmly in my hand and I turn the sides. The good thing about this way of trimming pots is that it grants you access to the entirety of the sides and the base at once. Although of the three methods I've shown you of securing your pots down in place to trim, it's probably the most difficult one to get right, but they become such extraordinarily useful objects, especially when you're trimming lots of identical pots en masse, as you don't have to fuss around with slip or lumps of soft clay to secure the pot down in place. For those of you using tungsten carbide turning tools, you may find that they chatter somewhat as you're using them. So often, after trimming a pot, I'll scrape over that same surface with a sharp metal kidney like this, just to remove the worst of those indentations. It also helps to trim your clay when it's slightly on the firm side of leather hard. The only advantage this method has, where the base is slipped and the rim is now facing upward, is that not only can you trim the sides, but you can also trim the rim, which not all pots need, but sometimes you'll find that they're either a bit too thick or you forgot to finesse them at the throwing stage. And so there's no harm at fixing them at this point. And for a drinking vessel especially, I bevel out that thick angular top and make it into a sharper, although still rounded point that fits comfortably into the corners of your mouth. You may find though, that you've thrown a pot that has a wobbly rim. This can be difficult to correct, but I do it like this. As you can see, there's a high point that spins around. This is the area I want to trim away first, not the low point. This means when I hold my turning tool, I do so extraordinarily firmly, supporting it from underneath, holding it in space so it only carves clay away from the highest point as it spins around. As that high point lowers, you'll progressively remove more and more clay as the rim levels out. And then you can begin taking clay from the sides and from the interior too, which should help. And you'll be left with a rim that's far more even compared to that you began with. It doesn't matter if it's not perfect as any undulation in the rim at this point is really just exaggerated by the fact that the pot is spinning around quickly, which makes the undulation far more obvious. Yet, as soon as I stop rotating the wheel, your eye won't pick up that discrepancy nearly so easily. To remove pots from the wheel that have been stuck down with slip, I begin by scraping away some of the excess clay from around the base, and then I use the tip of the sharp knife whilst cupping the pot with my left hand which is ready to catch the vessel once it's removed, I then gently slide the sharp tip underneath the pot. And it should quite easily dislodge, as long as you didn't apply too much slip in the very middle of the pot. Now, if I was to trim the base of this pot, before placing it down, I would scrape away all the excess clay on the wheel, as I don't want this embedding itself into the rim I've just so carefully finished. I then lightly place the pot down, gently tap center it into the middle, and then I secure it in place with three lugs of soft clay. As I do this, I'm always pushing down on the pot from the top, and as the rim is a more flexible part of the pot, when I push these lugs of clay down, I push them directly down, and I let the excess that's squashed against the pot be the clay that pins it in place, like this. 
I don't want to push the clay horizontally into the rim of the pot, as that could distort the opening and make it more oval in shape. And now, as long as the rim on my pot was thrown level, then the base of the pot should spin level too. And now the base can be turned. When trimming an upturned pot like this, you always need to keep some kind of downward pressure applied to the pot itself. When the tool is in the very middle of the pot, it's the tool that's applying that downward pressure. But as it moves off to one side, the fingertips on my left hand take over and they push down really quite firmly throughout this process. If the thickness of the base can take it. If the base is too thin and you can't trim like this, then you can just use larger lumps of clay around the outside to secure the pot down. And if you feel when you've picked up your pot before trimming it, the base of your piece is quite thick and heavy, then you can trim quite a lot away to remove that heft. But generally, if I'm making a flat bottom piece, this is how I'll finish it. I begin by turning the base flat, and then I remove a beveled edge of clay from around the outside, which I do for reasons I'll discuss in a moment. I then use a sharp, flat metal kidney to burnish these surfaces. This pushes the more coarse particles contained in the clay, like sand and grog, back into the body, creating a smoother, burnished surface. And lastly, I take my maker's mark and stamp it into the leather hard clay. And that's one mug finished, ready for a handle. Now, here's the reason I bevel the bottoms of my pots. The first thing is that in contrast to an untrimmed piece, a raggedy sharp edge like this will be far more susceptible to being chipped as it's used. Whereas with a beveled piece, the edge which actually makes contact with the tabletop is far more obtuse and is less likely to chip or be damaged with use. It also creates a band of shadow which makes the pot appear as if it's just floating ever so slightly, which makes it visually appear just a bit lighter. There are other ways of trimming the bases of pots though, and if you feel like the base of your pot is really thick and heavy, then we can trim it like this to make it feel more even and balanced in your hands. I begin by scoring a line, and this marks my outer boundary of where I'll be trimming. I'll then gradually remove clay layer by layer from inside this designated area. As I trim, I'll periodically push down with a fingertip or thumb, and if I feel like the base bows inwards or moves ever so slightly, then I know it's time to stop trimming. But if it doesn't budge and it still feels really sturdy, then you can keep going down. I'd lightly trim over the outer portion of the foot just to remove the majority of the lines left from when the pot was wired off the wheel after being thrown. And then I can keep trimming down until I'm comfortable with the thickness of the base. And if you ever need to check the piece to feel the weight, don't be afraid of just removing the pot from the wheel mid-turning to check that. Here's what the cross section looks like for the piece with the bevel bottom I trimmed earlier. Ideally, we want the clay to more or less be even from top to bottom and throughout the base too. But sometimes, even if you've trimmed the base and you feel like there shouldn't be any excess clay left and it's still heavy, then it may be because you've got some excess clay in the interior corners here and here. And this is why when you're throwing a pot, it's so important to consider the inside form of the piece you're making. And if you're making a cylinder, for instance, you should throw the interior with a sharper right angle like this. That way there's no excess clay you can't remove at the turning stage. You can trim the insides of pots, but it's always quite a difficult task as you can't really see or feel what you're doing and all the trimmings simply clog up on your tool, which makes it even harder. And so just by making sure at the thrown stage, the interior of your pot is a certain shape, it can make the turning process itself far more straightforward. And here's the pot which had the trimmed footwell. And this is really just another way of doing it. And it leaves you with a nice hollow you can glaze, which is something you couldn't do to the previous pot. Ultimately, there's no right or wrong. As long as the pot you're making is finished to a high standard and it isn't overly bottom heavy, it doesn't matter what it looks like. And that's the joy of handmade ceramics, as there's just an infinite way of finishing pots. If you're trimming and the walls of your pot become unstable and begin to move, then that likely means either your clay is too soft or you've trimmed away too much from them, which is exactly what I'm demonstrating here. If you can indent the clay with just a small amount of pressure with your fingertip, then the walls of the pot are far too thin, and there's really very little you can do to save the piece if this happens. Thankfully though, pots can be thrown quite quickly, so making another one isn't too arduous, and clay is recyclable, so all of this can easily be reclaimed and reused. If you're turning and your trimmings are simply sticking directly back to the pot itself, then your pot is still way too soft to be refining, and it still probably needs another few hours at least, or being left overnight, before it can be trimmed properly. 
But ultimately, so much of this depends on the country you live in, the weather, what the environment in your studio is like, whether the kilns have been firing or not, and even the type of clay itself. There isn't just one way of drying your pots. It's the right condition. That's something you learn with experience. I hope you found this video helpful. Trimming is one of my favourite parts of making pots. And so whilst this video covers the basics, if I've missed anything, please let me know and I'll make a follow-up video. And I also want to make a more advanced guide in the future. Anyhow, thanks so much for watching and best of luck trimming your pots. Oh, and if you ever want to share your progress with me on Instagram, I'd love to see all the pots you guys are making and I'll see you next week.